by giving uh, the audience a few cues, uh, a few sound effects, a few lines of dialogue. You can make them create um, visual ideas uh, in their heads that are, at least in my opinion, sometimes even more powerful than television or than film or even than novels or books. I think they... I think audio drama strikes this really interesting middle ground by giving um, the audience, the listeners, just enough to create this amazing detailed portrait uh, in their head. Anyone who talks about audio drama is legally obliged to play this. Uh, here is War of the Worlds by Orson Welles. <laughs> We're gonna play five minutes of it and um, Essentially, this is just, I play it because it's the most well-known thing, but I kind of want you to close your eyes and not imagine that you're being tricked. Just let yourself be transported uh, by the sound effects, by um, the production, by the acting. And without further ado, here is the only audio drama most people have heard about. Bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News, Toronto, Canada. Professor Morse of Macmillan University reports observing a total of three explosions on the planet Mars between the hours of 7.45 p.m. and 9.20 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This confirms earlier reports received from American observatories. Now nearer home comes a special bulletin from Trenton, New Jersey. It is reported that at 8.50 p.m. a huge flaming object, believed to be a meteorite, fell on a farm in the neighborhood of Grover's Mill, New Jersey, 22 miles from Trenton. The flash in the sky was visible within a radius of several hundred miles, and the noise of the impact was heard as far north as Elizabeth. We have dispatched a special mobile unit to the scene, and we'll have our commentator, Carl Phillips, give you a word picture of the scene as soon as he can reach there from Princeton. In the meantime, we take you to the Hotel Martinet in Brooklyn, where Bobby Millette and his orchestra are offering a program of dance music. Take you now to Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Carl Phillips again, out at the Wilmot Farm, Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Professor Pearson and myself made the 11 miles from Princeton in 10 minutes. Well, I hardly know where to begin. I paint for you a word picture of a strange scene before my eyes, like something out of a modern Arabian night. Well, I just got here. I haven't had a chance to look around yet. I guess that's it, yes. I guess that's the thing directly in front of me. Half buried in a vast pit. Must have struck with terrific force. The ground is covered with splinters of a tree. It must have struck on its way down. But I can see if the object itself doesn't look very much like a meteor. At least not the meteors I've seen. It looks more like a huge cylinder. Has a diameter of, um... um what would you say, Professor Pearson? What's that? Uh, what would you say, uh, what's the diameter of this? About 30 yards. About 30 yards. The metal on the sheath is, well, I've never seen anything like it. The color is sort of yellowish-white. It's curious. Spectators now are pressing close to the object in spite of the efforts of the police to keep them back. They're uh, getting in front of my line of vision. Uh, 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 would you mind standing one side, please? A while the police are pushing the crowd back. Here's Mr. Wilmot, owner of the farm here. He may have some interesting facts to add. Mr. Wilmot. Uh, would you please tell the radio audience as much as you remember of this rather unusual visitor that dropped in your backyard? Uh, step closer, please. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Wilman. Well, I was listening to the radio. Uh, closer and louder, please. Pardon me? Uh, louder, please, closer. Yes. <clears throat> I was listening to the radio and kind of drowsing. A professor fellow was talking about Mars, so I was half dozing and half... Yes, yes, Mr. Wilman, and uh, then what happened? Well, as I was saying, I was listening to the radio... Kind of halfway. Yes, Mr. Wilmot. And then you saw something. Well, not first off. I heard something. And what did you hear? A hissing sound like this. Uh, kind of like a Fourth of July rocket. Yes, then what? I turned my head out the window and would have sworn I was to sleep and dreaming. Yes. I seen a kind of greenish streak and then zingo. Something smacked the ground. Knocked me clear out of my chair. Well, were you frightened, Mr. Wilmot? 
Well, I ain't quite sure. I reckon I was kind of riled. Well, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Wilmoth. Thank you very much. Yeah, you want me to tell No, that's quite all right. That's plenty. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just heard Mr. Wilmoth, owner of the farm, where this thing has fallen. I wish I could convey the atmosphere, the background of this fantastic scene. Hundreds of cars are parked in a field in back of us, and the police are trying to rope off the roadway leading into the farm, but it's no use. They're breaking right through. The car's headlights throw an enormous spotlight on the pit where the object's half buried. Now, some of the more daring stories now are venturing near the edge. Yeah, the silhouettes stand out against the metal sheen. <laughs> One man wants to touch the thing. He's having an argument with the policeman. Now, the policeman wins. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there's something I haven't mentioned in all this excitement, but it's becoming more distinct. Perhaps you've caught it already on your radio. Listen, please. Do you hear it? It's a curious humming sound that seems to come from inside the object. I'll uh, move the microphone nearer. Here. Now, we're not more than 25 feet away. Uh, can you hear it now? Uh, Professor Pearson. Yes, sir. Uh, can you tell us the meaning of that scraping noise inside the thing? Possibly the unequal cooling of its surface. I see. Do you still think it's a meteor, Professor? I don't know what to think. The uh, metal casing is definitely extraterrestrial. Uh, not found on this Earth. Friction with the Earth's atmosphere usually tears holes in a meteorite. This thing is smooth and... You can see it's cylindrical uh, shape. Something's happening. Ladies and gentlemen, this is terrific. This end of the thing is beginning to flake off. The top is beginning to rotate like a screw and the thing must be hollow. He's moving! Keep back there! Keep back there! Keep those men back! Keep back there! Keep those idiots back! Take off! The top's loose! Look out there! Stand back! Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most terrifying thing I've ever witnessed. Wait a minute. Someone's calling someone or something. I can see peering out of that black hole, two luminous discs. The eyes, it might be a face, might be almost... Oh, oh, heavens, something wriggling out of the shadow like a gray snake. Now it's another one and another one and another one. They look like tentacles to me. Oh, yeah, I can see the thing's body. Now it's large. It's large as a bear. It glistens like wet leather, but that face, it's... it's Ladies and gentlemen, it's indescribable, but I can hardly force myself to keep looking at it. It's so awful. The eyes are black and they gleam like a serpent. The mouth is that's kind of V-shaped with saliva dripping from its rimless lips. It seems to oh, it quiver and pulsate, and the monster or whatever it is can hardly move. It seems weighed down by uh, possibly gravity or something. The thing's rising up now, and the crowd falls back. It seems plenty. The most extraordinary experience, ladies and gentlemen, I can't find words. And, well, I'll pull this microphone with me as I talk. I'll... I have to stop the description until I can take a new position. Hold on, will you please? I'll be right back in a minute. And there we go. So I uh, play this for uh, three reasons. First, um, Orson Welles was 23 when he made that. So hopefully that makes you feel really just bad about your life <laughs> and what you've accomplished. <laughs> um, the second reason is that I think it um, demonstrates uh, the power of audio drama. Um, War of the Worlds uh, is famous pretty much because uh, lots of, apparently lots of people thought it was um, real. I mean, it's that's disputed, but it's a really, really good audio drama. It demonstrates the power of uh, how it can transport you with just a few sound effects and actors' voices. And it also demonstrates how good found footage is uh, in the audio drama form. Um, if you know the message, the uh, GE uh, panoply thing, I am 90% sure that the pitch meeting was, okay, let's update War of the Worlds, but with podcasts. Um, and the third reason I um, uh, played it is I think it demonstrates how big audio dramas were in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, before television and um, as television was uh uh, building up, they were probably, I and mean, I think it's safe to say, the um, dominant popular um, media in American life. It was, it's almost inconceivable to think of how popular they were. Um, 
you had uh, stuff like uh, the Lone Ranger, uh, the Shadow, um, you and uh, suspense. Suspense is something that I'd that I'd recommend uh, listening to if you're. Uh, into it. You also had terrible racist stuff. The most popular <laughs> um, uh, radio show by far was Amos and Andy, which is vile. It's blackface in audio form, and it's the worst thing ever. Um, but you also had really good stuff, uh, too. So um, I'm actually going to pass around uh, some cool old records of uh, famous uh, audio dramas. And uh, thank you so much, Tori, for uh, lending me them. So, yeah, just read those descriptions, kind of bask in their awesomeness. Um, so before I uh, talk too much about uh, the history of audio drama, I kind of want to define my terms and talk about, like, what audio dramas actually are, in case anybody was wondering. So, um, and let me uh, get my notes out so I can, like, actually say, <laughs> uh, say what I'm thinking, because it's difficult to define like an art form <laughs> like I, this this took me so long to do surprisingly um so anyway very very simply um audio dramas are a way of telling stories through sound um without visuals only audio um but even that is too broad uh, because it includes audiobooks uh, writers just uh, reading their stories, um, which are great. I love audiobooks. Um, Harry, uh, the, those Harry Potter audiobooks are amazing. Um, Audible does some great stuff. Um, but they aren't audio drama, at least my conception of them. Um, and essentially, the, the thing I came down to, um, radio drama, uh, audio drama, has to be dramatized. So the stories aren't read, they're acted. Um, whether that's people in... Uh, playing the Lone Ranger or uh, the Shadow or the fake newscaster in War of the Worlds or the fake radio host in Welcome to Night Vale or the fake podcast host in The Message or the uh, fake podcast host in um, Archive 81 or the fake podcast host in The Black Tapes or <laughs> the fake pod... Yeah, there's a lot of um, <laughs> uh, fake podcast hosts. Um, so... Also, just as a note, audio drama is a really dumb name. It's very stupid because it implies that they're all in the um, drama genre. Um, it's not true at all. Um, they can be comedy, science fiction, horror, whatever you want. Um, and drama, at least to me, means uh, it's it, they're dramatized. It doesn't mean the genre. Um, and they can be distributed anywhere. You'll often hear uh, the term radio drama, but they're not just broadcast on radio. They can be broadcast, as you've seen, um, through LPs, through podcasts, uh, through CDs, um, whatever you want, really. So the definition that I've come up with is dramatized t stories told through sound. And I'm... Yeah, that's a fine, you know, definition. Okay, whatever. Um... Let's move on. <laughs> I, I'm not confident about it, but whatever. Uh, I think it serves our, our purposes, at least for a couple um, minutes, uh, the, at least for the 90 minutes of this lecture. Um, so War of the Worlds is a great uh, example of the golden age of audio drama. Like I mentioned before, when uh, audio drama, w um, when radio was the uh, most popular media uh, of the day, at least in America and pretty much throughout the world, um, and you had, like I said before, um, really popular stuff. Um, uh, you had uh, the Lone Ranger, uh, the Green Hornet, uh, the Shadow, characters that are still uh, with us, even you know, <laughs> uh, 50, 60, 70 years later. Um, and yeah, if you want to know more about that, because there's so many great stories and so many great um, pieces of fiction that were told in that um, time period, I would uh, recommend um, uh, two things. Uh, just as a starting off point, uh, Ken Burns' Empire of the Air is a really great documentary about the early day days of radio. It's on Netflix. I know everybody's on Netflix. Just, you know, instead of watching Strang Stranger Things for the third time, Watch that. Um, the AV Club also has a really good primer on the golden age of uh, radio. They give a 
a much uh, less cursory examination of it. Um, and it's, it's a little bit in depth, has a bunch of links that you can follow. Um, and basically, after the 30s and 40s and 50s happened, uh, TV came along and audio drama kind of went dead for about 50 years. That is a gross oversimplification. <laughs> it's very cursory. Um, the BBC has a long tradition of uh, audio drama. Um, basically, every famous British actor that you know about has acted in, a, in something for the BBC. Um, and the fact that uh, the BBC uh, is government supported and people like it kind of demonstrate how good uh, publicly funded media is. But I won't go down that avenue, even though you should. Uh, yeah, so. Radio drama uh, and audio drama weren't quite dead in the US, but for our very cursory examination of the history, they kind of were. Um, and they were that way for about 50 years until um, the rise of the podcast. And that's where I come in. No, that's not where I come in. I come in <laughs> like <laughs> a, year, uh, a year ago. Um, so the uh, rise of podcasts, um, kind of came in stops and starts. We're apparently on the third wave of podcasts. I don't know what <laughs> what wave we're on. Uh, you can probably just Google it. Um, <laughs> so um, from the face of it, podcasts and audio dramas are a match made in heaven. They are um, essentially perfect for each other. Uh, you can uh, take stuff with you. Uh, you can play it in your car. You can, um, they're really easy to release. Uh, you can listen to the uh, entire archive in a super simple, super easy way. Um, they're amazing. And as soon as podcasts kind of caught on in like uh, 06, 07, 08, audio drama should have, at least I think they should have, um, been released and been super popular. However, they they took a while to catch on, and I th I there are a couple reasons for that. Um, that's not to say that um, audio drama hasn't been released uh, since the early days of podcasting. It has. Um, it hasn't been that mainstream though. Um, so we're going to kind of gloss over it. <laughs> uh, yeah, this this history is very very cursory, so we can get to uh, more interesting stuff. Not that. Uh, podcasts and radio drama history isn't interesting. Um, so audio dramas weren't immediately popular as three dudes talking about tech, three dudes talking about comedy, three dudes talking about insert topic here. Um, but the buy-ins are just higher than three dudes talking, even though the buy-ins are pretty low. Um, so you had a lot of storytelling podcasts, uh, stuff like uh, Selected Shorts, um, which I really like, and Pseudopod. Um, lots of people essentially reading, uh, releasing audiobooks through podcast form, um, and uh, people would just read their fictional stories that have maybe some sound effects, and those are awesome. I, I really like them. Pseudopod uh, is a really, really great show. Uh, so is Escape Pod, but they're not really audio dramas um, in the definition I gave you like three, four minutes ago. Um, so I, I think... Um, for the purposes of this, the first one was to receive a fair amount of attention was We're Alive, at least from what I can tell, which is a zombie post-apocalyptic th thing with kind of a lot of um, action scenes, fun and exciting. Um, but when we're talking about the actual mainstream, uh, I kind of want to bring up two podcasts that, um, uh, that kind of broke through and made audio drama a mainstream thing in, um, in podcast circles. And the first one is, hopefully this will play, and it can play for a couple minutes. This is a story about you, said the man on the radio, and you were pleased because you always wanted to hear about yourself on the radio. Welcome to Night Vale. This is a story about you. You live in a trailer 
out near the car lot next to old woman Josie's house. Occasionally, she'll wave at you on her way out to get the mail or more snacks for the angels. Occasionally, you'll wave back. You're not a terrible neighbor as far as it goes. At night, you can see the red light blinking on and off on top of the radio tower, a tiny flurry of human activity against the implacable backdrop of stars and void. You'll sit out on the steps of your trailer with your back to the brightness of the car lot, watching the radio tower for hours, but only sometimes. Mostly, you do other things. This story is about you. You didn't always live in Night Vale. You lived somewhere else, where there were more trees, more water. You wrote direct mail campaigns for companies selling their products. Dear resident, you wrote often. Finally, some good news in this dreary world. At last, a reason not to kill yourself. Then you would delete that and write something else, and it would be sent out, and it would not be read by anyone. You had a friend, and then a girlfriend, and then a fiancé. The same person. She cooked dinner sometimes, but sometimes you cooked. You often touched. One day, you were walking from the glass box of your office to your old Ford probe, and a vision came to you. You saw above you a planet of awesome size, lit by no sun. An invisible titan, all thick black forests and jagged mountains and deep, turbulent oceans. It was so far away so desolate, and so impossibly, terrifyingly dark. And that day, you did not go home. You drove instead. You drove a long time, and eventually, you ended up in Night Vale, and you stopped driving. You have been haunted ever since by how easy it was to walk away from your life and how few the repercussions were. You never heard from your fiancé or your job again. They never looked for you, which doesn't seem likely, or maybe it's that in Night Vale you cannot be found. The complete freedom, the lack of consequence, it terrifies you. Okay, there we go. So that is Welcome to Night Vale, um, and it is by far the most popular audio drama on iTunes and basically wherever you get um, your podcasts. Uh, It is, um, the guys behind it have released a couple books. Uh, They've been on the Colbert Report. Um, They, by far, they're the most uh, popular uh, audio drama, at least in our current state. And current state, that was a weird thing to say, Uh, at least right now. And they... um, started in about um, 2012, I believe, Um, and they, it's not fair to say that they're the first audio drama or that uh, to be released via podcast or um, that they're the best audio drama to be released via podcast or that they're the only one. Um, Obviously, that is so, so uh, based on your own opinion, and that's so subjective, but I would say that they were probably the first truly mainstream audio drama to be released via podcast. And their part, um, the second one that I want to talk about is The Truth, uh, which is uh, by Jonathan Mitchell. Uh, It's um, out of Radiotopia. And I kind of wanted to play something, but I think uh, we're kind of going a little bit long Uh, on my very tightly scheduled lecture, so I am not going to play anything by the truth, even though the truth is really, 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 really good. Um, If you are at all curious about audio drama, it is the one that you should check out. Um, It's uh, amazing and funny and really smart. Uh, It's not serialized, uh, and they essentially push the boundaries of 
what audio drama can do. Um, if you are anything like me, you should start with Song of Knots, which is kind of like Adventure Time meets Quantum Leap. It's very, very good. Um, so those both started around 2012, and they both became very popular. And it's not fair to say after those two, a bunch of uh, audio dramas started being released and the floodgates were were opened and the second golden age of um, audio drama happened. It kind of, after Welcome to Night Vale and The Truth, there's kind of a little bit of a fallow period and obviously, once again, very cursory, lots of good audio dramas being released, just talking about the mainstream. But um, at, it was really after Serial that audio dramas kind of picked up their steam. You had stuff like Limetown, The Black Tapes, The Message, uh, The Bright Sessions, um, and those are the really, really popular ones. Uh, you, also, you can also include Archive 81 and The Deep Vault in that. I would. They're very good. Um, <laughs> so essentially, um, after the success of The Truth and Welcome to Night Vale, um, and after Serial essentially jump-started podcasts into the mainstream, um, we're kind of at a tipping point uh, for audio drama. Um, actual money is being invested into uh, podcasts, which uh, lifts all boats. There are companies working there. Uh, there are people who make their full-time living uh, making audio drama. What up, Jonathan Mitchell? And the people from Welcome to Night Vale and a couple other people. Like, it's like 12 people, but like, <laughs> there's still, it's still a fair amount. Um, Limetown's uh, got a TV deal, Welcome to Night Vale, as I said, was on the Colbert Report, not the Colbert Report, his new show that's not as good as the Colbert Report, uh, the late show. Um, Welcome to Night Vale has a bunch of books. We're in a really interesting time right now. Um, podcasts are mainstream, so audio drama can kind of sort of almost be mainstream. Um, and honestly, like I said before, podcasts are really, really great for audio drama. Um, People want to be entertained, and there are places where they can't read or watch TV. Uh, if you're driving or you're on the subway, if you're watching TV, you are being a danger to yourself and others. I'm talking more about driving, not so much on the subway. You can definitely watch YouTube on the subway. Um, and I don't think that um, documentaries and dudes interviewing Paul F. Tompkins Paul F. Tompkins about the comedy business are the only podcast genres available. I, I think that audio dramas are really cool and interesting. And this uh, begins the portion of the speech where I tell you why and why I think they're cool and interesting. So to get very, very, very um, pretentious, I think that um, the idea of a story being told only through sound kind of connects us to some imagined past of a bunch of cavemen or Neanderthals gathering around a fire, not really seeing uh, the storyteller tell the tale, and um, essentially just just hearing the sound effects, just hearing the voices. Um, that's my like very pretentious rant. I think I I just think they're cool. Um, it's basically kind of a magic trick uh, with um, you can create really interesting visual worlds using sound uh, by giving uh, the audience a few cues, uh, a few sound effects, a few lines of dialogue. You can make them create um, visual ideas uh, in their heads that are, at least in my opinion, sometimes even more powerful than television or than film or even than novels or books. I think they... I think audio drama strikes this really interesting middle ground by giving um, the audience, the listeners, just enough to create this amazing detailed portrait uh, in their head. And why did I uh, point to my head? You guys know where my head is. And, uh, <laughs> and the straight middle ground between that and then um, giving them too much so that uh, the monsters, the characters are so defined and they kind of lose a little bit of their uh, mystery. I also love how intimate it is, especially when you're listening um, via headphones. Uh, the stories can surround you in a way that's difficult to do in other, uh, in other forums. Um, you're almost completely transported to another world. Um, yeah, so it's... 
really cool <laughs> uh, to kind of anticlimactically uh, run that through. Um, I also like making uh, audio dramas because you can like cr uh, crunch up a little bit of cabbage and make it sound like a horrifying monster, or you can um, uh, record a couple lines of dialogue and like uh, put it all together and make it sound like a bunch of people are fleeing a, a gas storm and it's really creepy and it's really exciting. Um, I also love how low the barriers are to entry and how um, how audio drama at least have the potential to be this really um, to be a medium where a bunch of people can um, participate in the uh, barriers to entry. Essentially, you need a couple microphones um, and some editing software and a host. Um, an internet host, and you can release your podcast to everybody. Um, it's, it's, if me and my partner had wanted to release Archive 81 as a TV show, um, we, we were just talking about it. It would probably would have cost 50 to 100 times what we paid for it, um, if not much more, um, to, do it, to do it well. And um, you can't, there are very few uh, mediums that are not just writing, that are actually um, narrative art that uh, where two people um, working with a couple actors can make something really professional and really good. Um, yeah, so that's kind of why I like them. Uh, I like them for a bunch of reasons that are hard to pin down. Uh, it's like talking about why you like your girlfriend or boyfriend or mom or dad, or like, it, or your dog. It's like talking about why you like your dog. You like your dog because you like your dog. Um, <laughs> that was a great metaphor. Um, yeah, so before I get into technique and how me and my, co me and my um, producing partner make our audio dramas, does anybody have any questions about the history of the medium, uh, why they're good? Um, I, I gave a very cursory, um, kind of talk about that, and uh, if you have any burning questions, let's go for them, but I, I do want to keep um, the focus uh, more on uh, technique and why they're cool. So anybody have any questions? The qu uh, question was, um, essentially, uh, essentially you're saying that the uh, when you're uh, making your podcast, you have complete control over that, and I completely agree. When you're making your podcast, you have complete control over everything you do. I mean, I don't have complete control. I have a producing partner and he's terrible and he makes all the wrong decisions and I have to go by them. I'm kidding. Dan is, Dan is wonderful and uh, an amazing, amazing partner. Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, you can release, um, if you were making something visual, you could release that on YouTube. But um, with the amount of tension Archive 81 has gotten, like, we, we couldn't, like, have released or something to NBC or um, or ABC or CBS or Fox or HBO or um, however you want. But I, I, I agree, it's you get a lot of control and that's really, really cool. So I got into um, audio drama in high school, uh, basically in tandem with um, getting into um, audio as a medium. Uh, I, first got into This American Life. Um, if you are a radio producer, you are obligated to get into This American Life first. I think it's like in a contract you sign. Uh, you're obligated to sit in your driveway and listen to an episode and be like, oh my gosh, I want to do this for the rest of my life. And that's exactly what happened to me. Um, but I mean, almost immediately after that, I got into old radio dramas, uh, the stuff Orson Welles does, uh, Suspense, a bunch of other uh, stuff. Once again, um, check out the Primer and the AV Club. It gives a good uh, overview. And so in tandem with pursuing uh, documentary radio, which is kind of, um, kind of my day job, not kind of, it is my day job, um, I also uh, got into producing um, audio drama. So for my um, capstone project. Yes, I was in the Syracuse University's honor program, so uh, hopefully you are very impressed uh, by that meaningless, meaningless fact. Um, I produced a 10-episode uh, audio drama um, with Daniel Powell, who's my producing partner, uh, in the main role, um, 
and it was really good, and I released it, and nothing happened, and <laughs> nobody liked it. Um, not nobody. Nobody listened to it. The people who listened to it, who were my friends, liked it. At least that's what they said. Um, so uh, after that, uh, Dan and I um, were friends. We wanted to work together. And um, eventually, we decided that we should produce our own audio drama. And that turned into uh, Archive 81, which is our first uh, project. It's a found footage horror thing, kind of uh, Laird Baron meets Cronenberg meets Ursula K. Le Guin's ideas about capitalism. Um, and simultaneously, as we were releasing that, we um, started work on The Deep Vault, which is a kind of post-apocalyptic sci science fiction adventure. Um, that's lots of lasers, organic monstrosities. It's really fun. Um, and yeah, that's where I am now. Um, they're very popular, and ver I'm very famous, and I'm getting lots of money. That's definitely what's happening. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm going to uh, walk you through a little bit of the process. Um, so the first thing is, and this is pretty obvious, is the writing of it. Um, you come up with a general idea, and um, at least with me and Dan, um, we'll talk bad ideas back and forth, and then I'll outline, and then uh, we'll edit the outline together, then I'll write the episodes, and then we'll edit the episodes together. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about, about the writing process because it's really, really, really important. And I don't say that just because I do most of the writing. Um, <laughs> audio dramas are this sonic medium, and you have to write for sound, and that's completely different um, than writing for TV or writing for film or writing a novel or short story. So what does writing for sound mean? And to show you, I have a little bit of audience participation. Um, so with, will the three special guest stars come up? And I'm gonna uh, have them read um, the first scene of The Deep Vault. And I'll be, I will be the announcer. So um, I would actually like you to uh, close your eyes and I'm not saying that just because I want to steal your wallets. Um, yeah, so just close your eyes and picture, picture this in your mind's eye. So without further ado, Jeremy. Wait, which one's which? Oh. Alex? Yeah, you're, you're Alex, you're Carson, you're Jeremy. Okay. I told you this, guys. <laughs> Get it together, non-professional friends. <laughs> no, 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 no. We were supposed to have an hour before the storm hit. Looks like you got it wrong, genius. I didn't get it wrong. The report said we had an hour. Shut up and keep running! Yeah, it could be a good thing. Storm might keep the penitents off our tail. The penitents are not going to give a shit about a gas storm. They like the gas storms. That's the whole strange quasi-religious thing. You just caused our entire... If one of you trips while bickering, you'll probably die. Concentrate on where you're running. I think I see... Get your keys, Carson. Don't you have the... They're in your left front pocket, like always. Shit. Shit, shit, shit. Open the door. Hit the unlock button again. Shit. Come on, come on, come on. North Dakota and Tallahassee, Florida. This message will repeat. Citizens are urged to move to a designated relocation center. Today's hot zones. Drive. Turn the radio off. Stop shouting at me. I'm trying to drive your shit bucket. <laughs> and <Shit> scene. Shit bucket. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! Thank you. So, um, hopefully, um, you kind of got a sense of how awesome and kind those three people are. Um, but essentially, I want to kind of focus in on the difference that sound effects and atmosphere make. So I'm going to play um, that. And if you'll close your eyes the exact same way, we'll be good. Um. No, 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 no. We were supposed to have an hour before the storm hit. You got it wrong, genius. I didn't get it wrong. The report said we had an hour. Shut up and keep running. Yeah, could be a good thing. The storm might keep the penitents off our head. The penitents are not going to give a shit about a gas storm. They like the gas storms. That's their whole weird quasi-religious thing. You, you just caused our entire- If one of you trips while bickering, you will probably die. Concentrate on where you're running. I think I see- Got your keys, Carson. Don't you have them? They're in your left front pocket, like always! Oh. Shit, shit, shit. Open the doors! Hit the unlock button again! Shit! 
On, come on, come on! Drive. Jezebel, North Dakota, and Tallahassee, Florida. This message will repeat. Citizens are urged to move to a designated... Turn the radio off! Shouting at me. I'm Today's hot zones are... How fast can this car go? Make it... And that was uh, the first scene with sound effects. So, I, I mean, forgetting about the acting, like the... No, no. <laughs> you were all wonderful. But... As, <laughs> no, you were really good. I didn't bring you here just to make fun of you. Um, <laughs> I want you to uh, consider how much of an impact um, not just the sound effects, but um, the atmosphere had. The, um, uh, as we see in the business, room tone, the um, sound of the outside and how it differed from the sound of the inside of the car, the uh, clicking of the keys, the footsteps, um, the storms. Those are things, those are the things that transport you to another world. When you have your headphones around you, that's, that's what transports you. Um, and that's not, they're not just uh, important in the post-production process. You have to essentially write them in. They have to be considered from the very beginning. Um, writing for sound means think about, thinking about it, uh, thinking about the story um, as as a sonic thing. Um, that means finding ways to uh, insert cool things that work in sound. So if you, you're having two people uh, talking to each other, don't have it in just a quiet room. Have it either be like, oh, this is um, on uh, this weird scratchy tape with a bunch of weird uh, crazy glitches that somehow like, um, ties into the whole plot, um, have the MacGuffin be a record or a tape cassette rather than just like a cool globe. Or if you do have like a cool globe as the MacGuffin, have the cool globe glow. Uh, think about this as um, a sonic medium. The, there were a bunch of um, SFX pauses in the, in the script I gave these three awesome, amazing people who were totally nice enough to come up and be humiliated. Um, they, uh, and those were written into the script uh, since it's something that you need to think of from the very beginning. Um, yeah, so, yeah, and also with the dialogue, um, because it's, um, you have no visual cues, uh, it, that means a couple of things. It means that the dialogue has to carry the entire thing. Um, not, not the entire thing, the sound effects and atmosphere are very important, but if you aren't having like a chase scene, if you're just having two people talk to each other, you're relying on the dialogue and you're relying on not their faces, not their, you're not giving the audience anything to see. So the dialogue has to be interesting and it has to ratchet up. And the acting has to be, if not uh, heightened, at least um, you have to be able to convey all of the emotion just through voice. And that's really, really tricky. Um, yeah, so after it's written, um, and Dan and I have gone over this, and we've thought about sonic possibilities for every page of the script. You want something to be weird and interesting and cool and sound different um, on every page of the script. And once it's written, basically we go to the audition process, which is pretty much like TV or film editions, except that you cast entirely for voice. Uh, it, which is really cool because looks don't matter. So like somebody can me can totally be hired for something that's not like the Seth Rogen part. Um, yeah, and it's just how someone sounds and how someone fits the character and how they can convey all of the emotions and all of the um, ideas about the character, not through just their face or uh, just the way they move, um, just through their voice. And that's very, very difficult to do. Um, so... After we've cast and we've worked with awesome actors, um, we record the dialogue first before um, having re before recording the sound effects. Um, personally, we think that it's uh, much better to have the actors be in the same place. Uh, we think it gets much better performance, even though you can totally um, record separately. Um, 
in film and TV, that's basically impossible. And you can do that in um, audio drama. But we think that it, you get a much better performance just um, uh, just having the actors be able to react to one another. Um, so yeah, um, after you record the entire thing, and we record uh, every season in one go, which makes it much easier to, you know, do a bunch of podcasts at the same time and saves a bunch of time on our end, um, then the fun starts. You can create sound effects. And uh, for us, uh, for Dan and, Dan and me, Dan definitely is much more the sound, desi sound design guy. Um, but we work together. It's a mix of stuff that we create ourselves and uh, stuff we get off sound effects libraries. Like um, when I was working... Uh, making the college capstone project, I had a bunch of like spear thrusts and I would take my mic and I would stab a bunch of watermelons uh, to get that sound and then um, kind of alter it in uh, effects processing. And it was really, really cool. You can um, uh, have um, power lines be blasters. Uh, you can drop stuff in water for glooping, creepy stuff. Um, Dan uses logic to mess with the sound effects. And yeah, the sound effects are basically all of your uh, special effects in one package. They're your visuals. They're the things that create um, the uh, images in their mind's eye. Because you definitely can have the listener, the um, actors say, oh no, it's this monster who is eight feet tall and has two glowing glistening fangs in the front of its um, face and also has four legs and also uh, has a huge uh, chimera body. And like, you can describe something like that. Um, you can describe all the visual information you would get if you just saw a picture, but that's not good. That's terrible. <laughs> that's really, really boring. So what you want to do is you want to create um, situations and characters through um, uh, through hinted dialogue and sound effects. So, for example, in the Deep Vault, uh, we've got these monsters chasing them, and it's really creepy. Trust me, it's very creepy. Um, so all the uh, actors do is they, uh, the characters do, rather, is describe their teeth. Like, oh my god, there's so many teeth. And then we rely on that detail and the sound effects, uh, the huge, their huge galloping footsteps, and their dripping like weird claw things to create an image in a listener's mind that might not be the same for every person the way it would be if we had a um, picture of it, but is still going to be interesting and dynamic and cool. Um, yeah, so um, talking more about the sound effects and the sound, sound design, it's really important to make that an integral part of your story and have an intentionality to them. So um, to uh, talk about that, I'm going to play an example from Archive 81. It is my great privilege to welcome you to the private collection of one Mrs. Cassandra Wall. As I am unfortunately unavailable to escort you through the exhibit, this tape should serve as a useful guide to the objects contained within. Simply examine the pieces in sequential order and listen for the following explanation and context. You'll be accompanied by a manservant to ensure your safety. Physical contact with the objects is discouraged. And finally, as I'm sure Mrs. Wall's staff have informed you, your utmost discretion with regards to the collection is greatly appreciated. Object 304A, a small glass jar with a cork stopgap containing 20 millimeters of the substance colloquially known as mummy brown. Originally in the possession of noted pre-Raphaelite artist Dante Gabriel Rossetti, the paint was recovered from the coffin of his wife, Elizabeth Siddle. Interestingly, though her grave was excavated in 1986, her body was remarkably well preserved, possibly due to the effects of the laudanum in her system. Object 248D. A Victorian hand mirror, approximately 30 centimetres in length, recovered after a fire destroyed much of the Chentworth estate. The hand mirror exhibits the unique property of its reflection being delayed by approximately 8 milliseconds. 
the mirror has not undergone any impartial or scientific tests. Thus, as of now, the reasons for the effect are unknown. The heirloom belongs to the Chentwith family. It goes without saying that they've been unsuccessful in their many efforts to recover it. Object 309B. A collection of 28 unused bridal veils placed in a clear glass cube. Each of the veils was collected from a virgin who passed away the night before their wedding. Object 411K. Walrus tusk carving of an unknown deity found on the island of Chichagov in what is now the state of Alaska. Estimated date of creation approximately 700 AD. The carving depicts what appears to be a humanoid woman with gills and scales. The Tlingit people of the island profess no knowledge of either the deity or the manner of its carving. There is a residual trace of blood on the head of the figure. Object 155J. A mixed media piece by Gillian Creek entitled Sacred Profane Geometry Circles. The artwork consists of approximately 80 detailed architectural blueprints of the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building, folded into an origami sculpture depicting the Battle of Little Bighorn. The piece was obtained in 1978. Object unknown. We have been unable to catalogue this particular piece. Gazing upon it directly is difficult. The phrase non-Euclidean is called to mind. It might be advisable not to linger in this particular corner of the exhibit. Object 105C. A live canary in a gold wire cage. The canary, nicknamed Saint-Germain by the staff, has been in the collection for 38 years. Please do not feed the canary, as it appears to require neither food nor water. In all other respects, it seems to be an ordinary bird, though with an admittedly lovely song. This brings us to the conclusion of our tour. I know I speak for both Mrs. Cassandra Wall and the staff when I say that we deeply appreciate your donation, in whatever form that takes. So two things from that. First, if you ever get a chance to uh, work with a British actor, do. They make everything sound much creepier. Um, two, um, so all the weird, creepy um, glitches you heard, those were the sounds of um, decaying film reels. And uh, we played around with them, and Dan got them off a of sound effects library. And they go into the theme of Archive 81, which uh, it plays on lost memory, uh, recordings, stories. We had, um, for all the glitches, they're mostly uh, decaying film reels. And it's, um, for the Deep Vault, most of the sound effects are modular. They're synth-based. They're, uh, synth um, so that creates this kind of uh, idea of uh, 70s sci-fi, of unreality. You're put into a world of uh, cool science fiction. So the way that you think about sound effects, don't just think about them as, okay, I need to add in footsteps. Think about them as, um, uh, as thematic. Uh, so your writing uh, calls upon a theme and uh, talks about the issues that you want to talk about, but so should your sound design. It's it's equally as creative as the writing process. This is all part of the editing process. Uh, Dan uses Pro Tools. I'm personally a fan of Reaper. Um, like I was saying, Dan uses Logic to um, edit all his uh, sound effects together and do some cool modifications to them. Um, and you, when you're editing together, you want to make them a cohesive whole. Um, just as a pro tip, uh, if you're editing dialogue, uh, make sure that uh, people can hear the dialogue because you've been listening to that dialogue forever, so you definitely know what it is, and you want to make sure that the audience does too. Um, after you make that, you do a, like a ton of minor tweaks. Uh, you write the music, uh, put that in, and then you have basically um, an episode, and you do that 10 times, and it's a ton of... A lot of work. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> yeah, so, and I can get into the uh, process of releasing that and promoting it and making sure that you don't have like 12 uh, downloads, um, uh, which happened to Transmission, the thing I uh, released in college. Um, I can get that into that afterwards in the Q&A if that's something you're interested in. Um, so the main thing is to remember, uh, it's an audio medium, so write for audio, don't write for visuals. Um, things aren't cool when you're just describing them, as I was saying before. Uh, you want to suggest things and concepts. Uh, you are not the author of the story, the listener is. You are working with them as a partner to create a story. You, your thing only works if the images are created in their head. You want to make sure that the images that they create in their head are awesome and really cool. And the best way to do that is to hint at things and not to over-explain them because you have to trust your listener to have a really cool imagination. And I really hope that all our listeners do. I bet they do. Um, yeah, so you also want to ca casting is really important. Um, you want to cast them uh, actors for sound. Um, they're carrying the entire thing. <laughs> um, and getting the right actors is really, really important. Um, you don't want to overwhelm your audience um, with too many sound effects, too much things going on. But you also want to trust them um, that they're going to follow along with you. And um, they're going to be able to discern what you're talking about, or rather, um, sounding about. No, not sounding about. That's that's a weird thing to say. Um, so you want to make sound the, and I know I've been harping on this, but I, I've been harping on it because I think it's really important. You want to make sound the most important part of your story. You want to make the atmosphere important. You want to make the room tone important. You want to fit in that into the mood. Um, like how a director will compose visuals, you need to compose your audio. Um, yeah, so that's basically my advice. But before I get into the q and I have other people's advice, um, which is really cool, right? So you don't just have to listen to uh, my dumb thoughts on it. You can listen to other people's dumb thoughts on it. Uh, first up is my producing partner, Dan Powell, who um, um, a lot of, I'm going to get to his more technical stuff because he's such an expert on it. Um, but uh, overall, he says that uh, you should read fiction, uh, nonfiction, uh, read transcripts of how people talk, um, study how people talk closely. Um, getting into the more technical so side, he wants you to buy good gear because it'll save lots of money and it'll last you longer than cheap stuff. He uses a different word than stuff, but this is... Um, well, this will be broadcast to millions of people, and I don't want to swear, even though I just did three minutes ago. Um, he also said that USB microphones are the devil. Uh, don't use them. <laughs> um, you don't have to um, spend a fortune to get good quality. If you can, can't afford a soundproof studio space or traded room, go for a dynamic mic uh, like a Shure uh, SM68 or a Sennheiser MD421, um, and you can just uh, go through a Zoom H5 or uh, H6, which isn't a um, uh, recorder that I have at home, and they're really cheap, and they sound fine. Um, the gear itself doesn't matter. It's what you do with the gear. Um, it's how you use it and what it's recording that, uh, that matters. So um, basically, lots of good musicians make songs with cruddy instruments. Um, oh, and the... Um, okay, so, oh, I asked him why USB microphones were the devil, and he says... A, because they sound like shit. B, uh, they have the entire signal chain of microphone, preamp, amp, and AD converter entirely self-contained. So if one of those breaks, you have to get the whole thing fixed, as opposed to um, if your mic or interface or mixer craps out, um, you only need to fix one of those, and they break really easily, and they sound like garbage. Dan isn't a fan of USB mics. Uh, <laughs> that went on a lot longer in our G-chats. Um, and I have even more advice from people uh, who are not my producing partner um, that I asked uh, for this presentation. First up, uh, Jonathan Mitchell from The Truth, which I'm still really mad I didn't get to play because it's the best. Um, and it's his advice that he learned early on when he was still in college in the early 90s. And he advocates thinking of your competition as being the best media that exists anywhere. Your work is fighting for the attention of people who also watch TV and movies and read books and see plays and live in a rich and varied cultural world. I believe that 
what we make ultimately needs to measure up to that. If we want audio drama to be taken seriously as an art form, it has to stand alongside your very favorite work, however intimidating that might be. Um, on a technical level, the tools to make professional quality work are very accessible, so it's up to the creator to use them well. Um, the ability exists within you. It's not about opportunity or money. It's about you. Even if you are just starting out, I think you need to start by being ambitious about the quality of your work. It, will, it may take a while before it's actually where you want it to be, and that's okay. But you need to constantly strive for that because that's how um, you learn what you are truly capable of doing, and it's uh, through trying to fulfill that vision that you were able to mature and grow, which is really cool. Doesn't that seem like it should like go with inspiring music to underscore it? Thank you, Jonathan. That was really inspiring. Um, I also asked advice from uh, Lauren Shippen, who uh, does this awesome podcast called The Bright Tapes, which is kind of like X-Files meets uh, recorded therapy sessions. It's weird. It's really, really good. Um, so um, she says that uh, not thinking... Uh, inside the format is important. Like, you don't have to do a found footage thing just because that's what's popular, even though the, most of the stuff that I brought up was found footage. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, you can do anything in audio, and you, uh, you just have to be clever about that. So don't get bogged down by not having vis visuals. And another piece of advice is record and plan out as much as you possibly can before releasing. That's a really practical thing, but I wish I had done that a little bit more in our second season. And then we have Terry Miles from The Black Tapes, who wants me to say that, of course, their shows are 100% real-life documentaries, but if he was starting an audio drama, <laughs> uh, I would absolutely write and record all the episodes before releasing. I feel like mixing and tweaking can be done on the go, but writing and producing is a tough thing to tackle week to week. It's like chasing a speeding drain down a hill. So two people say the same thing, which is write, <laughs> uh, write and record before you release. And I would agree on that. That's really, really important. So I talked way too much, way more than I expected I would. So um, I, without further ado, I'm going to go to Q&A. So... Anybody have any cues that I can A? Your question was about, um, yeah, so your question was about um, the writing process uh, with sound effects and uh, where that comes in. And honestly, um, I found that um, thinking about them in tandem is really important. So um, you want to think of um, sound effects possibilities at the exact same time that you're writing the dialogue. So you're not... Um, so in the first scene that I got these three wonderful people to play, and I also played for you, um, like originally um, it started in a car, and um, they were fleeing, and we um, realized that it would be much more sonically interesting if it started with them running towards the car, so you could hear the storm on the outside, and then you could hear the storm from the inside of the car. So it's um, and. I had thought about the um, sound effects of the storm and a bunch of stuff like that from the beginning, but actually no, that was that was second draft. Sorry, um, I thought of a bunch of the sound effects at the beginning, but it changes as you edit. So you um, just like everything else, just like you um, write better dialogue on the second draft, just as you refine it, you think of cooler sound things to do on the second and third draft. But you want to. Um, think about that at every stage of the process. So, yes, you think about it on the th first draft. Yes, you think about it on the second. Yes, you think about it on the third, because that's what the audience is going to hear. Your question was, uh, do, I ever, do we ever play sound effects for the actors or tell them to leave 20 seconds? First part, um, no. Uh, the um, sound effects are all uh, done post-process, uh, post um, uh um, post-dialogue recording, uh, Dan will usually try and create a sonic template um, towards the early part of the process, and that's a lot of him um, recording uh, mic stuff, playing around with synths, trying to find the sonic palette that he'll use, but usually we'll create the sound effects later, and the actors will just work on their imaginations. Um, we don't tell them to uh, leave a specific amount of time, because that can be changed in editing, so that's not important. Her question was about um, the barriers to entry um, for production are really low, but the barriers to making stuff popular are uh, 
really high. And honestly, um, the barriers to uh, getting stuff popular are high anywhere. Like if you want to do a YouTube um, channel, it's it's hard to get it popular. Um, so, yeah, it's it's tough. It's tricky. Like there, the iTunes thing. Um, we've we've had a couple bumps in our um, uh, in our downloads in our audience, and by far uh, we've been covered in Wired. Uh, we've been covered in a bunch of other places, um, but by far the biggest bump was being featured on the front page of iTunes. And there's no like. Um, there's no way to uh, gimmick that. That's that is one person's taste uh, who just looks at uh, what's going, <laughs> what's uh, getting popular, and what's um, he'll, he'll, his name is Steve. He's really nice, <laughs> and he uh, yeah, and basically he'll decide what's a banner, and he'll decide it based on quality and what he likes, which is really, which is honestly is really cool because it's not based on an algorithm. You can't game it. It's just based on quality. Um, and and Steve is really, really generous about um, making sure that there's a lot of diversity in uh, the front page and on iTunes. Um, and I think, but like to get stuff popular, um, so the difference between, um, there's a lot of difference between the thing I released in college, Transmission, which is now available as a Patreon exclusive, um, yeah, no, I'm not promoting my Patreon, don't worry about it, um, is, and, uh, Archive 81 and the Deep Vault, um, Archive 81 and the Deep Vault are much, much better, um, working with Dan is amazing, he is a sound effects genius, he is really incredible, um, I, I would like to consider myself a much better writer, um, sorry about that, uh, and, um, they're much better, but the difference is also, I, um, Dan and I, really thought of promotion as something that we needed to do. Um, first and foremost, your product has to be very good and it has to be and it has to be something you're proud of and it has to be something people liked. But you also can't just think that your product can be um, just left into the wilds and people will discover it on their own. Some people might, most people will not. Um, Dan and I release, uh, do press releases. We uh, go on interviews. We um, created something called, uh, created a hashtag called Audio Drama Sunday, which is where a bunch of audio drama people uh, cross promote stuff. Um, it, yay. And you should check that out. Um, there's, there's a lot of, um, I would th uh, try and think of um, promotion and getting your stuff out there as being extremely important and not just laying that to the side. That's a large amount of my work every week. Uh, with voice casting, how do we find people? Um, so it's a mixture. Um, so uh, Mr. Davenport, uh, who is the creepy southern um, evil uh, corporate guy in season one is uh, my co-producer's father. Um, and we actually, he's, he, there are three people we don't pay in the first season of Archive 81. We don't pay Dan's dad. We do not pay Dan's roommate who has two lines. And there's a waiter who says, um, that'll, will that be all, sir? Or something. And we don't pay him. So we don't pay all our actors. <laughs> um, but those are the only three we didn't, didn't pay. Um, so, um, it's a mixture of people we know personally, um, uh, Craigslist is a surprisingly good resource. I, Dan and I were very surprised by the quality of actors we got on Craigslist. And um, we also um, posted it to a couple uh, list serves, um, Public Radio NYC, uh, the Sonic Soiree. And after casting Archive 81, a lot of the way we cast um, our, um, The Deep Vault and what, how we're casting Archive 81 Season 2 is excuse me, um, friends of the actors that we used. And so essentially you just, we're just broadening our network. And once you've cast one thing, you, they, um, if you've worked well <laughs> with them and you haven't just, I don't know, like run over their dog, they will tell their, fr their acting friends about it. Whenever possible, um, 
Dan and I like to be both in the room. Uh, sometimes that's not since Dan, not possible since Dan's in New York and I'm in Boston. But um, for the most part, for the Deep Vault, which we I, I really liked how it went down. We uh, rented a studio and we had the actors. Um, uh, we talked to them about their character beforehand, emailed back and forth a little bit, and talked to them before they got into the studio. And we had them in a room uh, recording. Dan was looking at um, the levels and making sure everything was kosher and good and didn't, like, nobody went off mic or anything. And I was listening to their, perf their performance. And for, at least for me, um, first I'll do a, a, essentially a fun take, however... Um, uh, however they want to do it. And then for season, uh, for the second take, I'll give individual notes. Um, I'll never like tell them, uh, give them vocal stuff. I won't tell them how to say something because that's a terrible directing decision. Um, I'll just uh, tell them what emotions to, hi uh, to heighten, uh, what, to think, uh, what things to think of when they're um, playing the scene. And then for... Um, the last one, I, we usually do three takes, and we usually keep them long because we want actors to kind of find their rhythm and work well together. Well, um, I'll just basically, <laughs> everything I said was uh, have fun and dial it up to 11 and just let them run wild. And yeah, that's how we direct. I will say that our uh, production costs for Archive 81, um, we both put in a couple hundred dollars each, um, Dan and I did. So, um, and that's for all of the, uh, all of the work. Um, and the, th the good thing about um, keeping um, uh, all your recording to, um, to uh, in one fell swoop is that you can have your actors act for an hour or two and then leave, or or in the case of the deep fault, uh, a day or two and then leave, uh, rather than like get them every uh, week or so. Yeah. Question was how many uh, episodes we record at the time. We record seasons at a time. So um, this entire first season of Archive 81 was recorded in a couple weeks in one fell swoop. Uh, the entirety of the deep vault was recorded in one uh, weekend. <laughs> it was a f exciting weekend, uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, yeah, so we'll record seasons at a time. So the question was, is there any changes to the script uh, while we're recording or after the process? Answer, no, my script is are, are, are always perfect and amazing, and I'm a genius. <laughs> um, well, uh, the, the answer is that um, uh, there will be slight line changes, uh, especially with uh, Dan, who voices the main character in Archive 81. <laughs> um, he'll uh, uh, change some dialogue to better suit uh, his personality, because Dan is a little bit very, very faintly based on the real-life Dan. Um, he'll change some of the uh, voice stuff. Sometimes we'll have our actors talk about little line changes, um, but... Honestly, it's there's not a lot of improvisation. Um, it's it's uh, it's not extremely rigid, but you know, we we keep to the script. The question was, uh, I've tied uh, audio drama fairly strongly into podcasting, um, and is that the only thing that I think is um, relevant? And honestly, yes. Like I think that um, it, it can definitely be done through radio. Um, like I said before, um, audio drama is not tied into one specific medium, but it is right now podcasts are where it's at. Um, it is, it's so easy for people to download it, to listen to it, to, um, take it anywhere. Um, radio, radio is cool. Uh, I mean, you could release via CD if you were releasing to an audience of 45 year olds and 80 year olds, <laughs> um, you, you could do release in a bunch of ways. And I'm sure like Dan and I were talking about how cool it would be to release the f first season of Archive 81 as a bunch of cassettes, uh, and tapes. That'd be cool. Like, but I think that podcasts right now are where it's at and where, I think the future of audio drama lie very strongly, at least for the next couple of years. Thank you all for coming. Um, yeah. 
The other thing I really don't like is when people can smile and not move, and not move their eyes. Like, so their eyes like, don't crinkle, and so it's just like they're kind of... <laughs> Like, you know, you see a chimpanzee with its teeth like that, and everyone thinks it's cute because it's smiling. That's actually how a chimpanzee um, shows terrible anger. 